Hi, my name is Bill Weiss, the author of the New York Times bestseller, 23 Minutes in Hell. And I'm on Faith's Edge with Joe Taylor. No Christian has an identity as a Christian like a Muslim has an identity as a Muslim. We are lightweights, lightweights when it comes to them. You want to talk about religious commitment. You don't see it in Christianity. Wow, Kent. Wow, Kent. That is a bold statement. Can't wait to hear what you say about that uh, later in today's show. Thank you to Mr. Bill Weiss for the introduction. Bill was on our 78th episode talking about his New York Times bestseller, 23 Minutes in Hell. Like the title indicates, Bill claims he spent 23 minutes in hell and witnessed all of its horror and torment. It's really an interesting story, and you, you can hear our conversation at onfaithsedge.com slash 78. That's onfaithsedge.com slash 78. Well, hello. Welcome to the 84th episode of On Faith Sedge. My name is Joe Taylor, recovering atheist and your servant in Jesus Christ. This is your place to hear conversations about God and living a life of faith in Jesus Christ. Wow, what, a, what an amazing couple of weeks I've had. I have become a grandpa, believe it or not. For the second time, my uh, first grandchild, his name is Joseph. We call him Little Joe, Jojo. I actually call him the boy. Uh, as you know, uh, if you may have heard in the past, I have three daughters, uh, all amazing, amazing young women. In fact, my uh, middle daughter, Jenna, she just got back, uh, is getting back from a trip to Arizona. She just decided to adventure out a little bit and uh, head out to Arizona to see some friends. A couple of weeks ago, my oldest daughter gave birth to a granddaughter. Uh, amazing, amazing. Her name is Meredith. And the miracle of birth is just something, something to behold. Uh, realizing that you hold in your hands a brand new life, an amazing gift from God. Her name is Meredith. In fact, her middle name has, has an interesting story behind it. When my daughter first got married, she actually contemplated keeping her maiden name, Taylor, my, my last name, uh, and then thought about hyphenating her name. Her husband, I'm not sure, liked that very much. And I'll be honest with you, when her and I talked about it, it was something that I, I thought, eh, you know, if I, was, if I was him, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't like it either. I'm fairly conservative and maybe a little old fashioned, but uh, I told her I probably wouldn't like it either. But you know what she did? When she went to change her name uh, after she got married, she dropped her middle name and replaced it with her maiden name, Taylor. I hope she doesn't mind her, me mentioning her name <laughs> across thousands of people. But anyway, her middle, her, now her name is permanently, her middle name is permanently Taylor. Well, when Meredith was born, they decided to name Meredith, Meredith Taylor. How cool is that? And she is perfectly healthy, perfectly fine. The Taylor family has a brand new addition. Welcome to the world. Meredith, Grandpa loves you. Well, over the years, we've heard trials, struggles, and victories from Grammy Award winners, best-selling authors, professional athletes, Dove Award winners, and other entertainers, authors, speakers, and prominent business people. We've heard from people like Michael Sweet from Striper, John Schlitt, Pat Boone, Joel Smallbone from For King and Country, hilarious comedian Shonda Pierce has been with us, Danny Gokey, and baseball great Daryl Strawberry. They've all shared their faith experience and much, much more of their life. Very transparent, deep conversations. All are amazing, inspiring, and thought-provoking stories. But now I want to hear from you. On Faith Sedge is introducing a new segment called Your Story, where you tell us your story of faith with all the triumphs, failures, frustrations, miracles, and celebrations. What is your faith story? How did you come to know Jesus Christ? Have you ever struggled with your faith or the existence of God? What has God brought you through? And if you don't believe in God, why? I'd love to hear from you as well. I'd love to hear your faith story. Visit onfaithsedge.com slash your story. That's onfaithsedge.com, your story. And let's begin the conversation. I really appreciate those of you who have reached out so far to tell their story. I'm preparing those talks now. 
and we'll bring them to you in episodes to come. Again, if you want to share your faith story, go to onfaithsedge.com slash your story. And I really love bringing you engaging conversations about faith. If this show entertains you, encourages you, inspires you, informs you, or brings any value to your life in any way, would you consider financially backing the show? And the best way to do that right now is to use any Amazon link at onfaithsedge.com. Uh, we'll get a modest commission for the purchase and it doesn't cost you a penny more. So if you'd be willing to support the show and you're buying something anyway, just go to onfaithsedge.com, use any Amazon link. There's a main one in the sidebar there. Again, we'll get a modest commission, nothing to get rich on, and the purchase won't cost you a penny more. Well, today's guest is Kent Philpot. Kent is a graduate of Sacramento State University, Golden Gate Baptist Seminary, and San Francisco Theological Seminary. Since 1984, Kent has pastored the Miller Avenue Baptist Church in Mill Valley, California. As the director of Earthen Vessel Publishing, he has authored numerous books, including the books we're going to talk about today, If Allah Wills and Islamic Studies. Kent has been studying Islamic theology and practice for 15 years while maintaining his own deep Christian faith. He intimately interacts with the Muslim community and professes friendship with leaders of the Islamic faith. He brings a unique perspective on relating to Muslims, tech talking to them about Christianity, and ultimately leading them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. You'll hear Kent and I discuss who is Allah. Are Christians, Jews, and Muslims really worshiping the same God? We'll talk about the origins of Muhammad and the Islamic faith. Who is Jesus to Muslims? What does the Quran teach about violence and how to reach out to the Muslim community? Many questions that I that I get from from believers and non-believers both is about is about the the Islamic faith. And uh, you have spent a long time, I believe the past 15 years, um, researching the Islamic faith yes. and in the Islamic community and interacting on a regular basis with Muslims. And I'm assuming that interaction is to communicate Christianity to them and bring them to Christ. Is that right? A lot of it. A lot of it is to learn from them, to establish relationships with them, with the ultimate purpose of uh, sharing Christ with them. So you have you you, you spend. Uh, uh, so I was right. You you spend a lot of time with with the Muslim Islamic community. Uh, I am ignorant of the Islamic faith, other than what I think I know about it. So two things, you're here to set me straight, and I'm here to ask a lot of questions. You have written a book, as we said in the introduction, If Allah Wills, and you also have another book, don't you? Uh, that, book is, that book is called Islamic Studies, Equipping the Christian Witness to Muslims. So how appropriate both of these books are in today's environment. Uh, if you could, to help me and to help uh, uh, members of the audience... Tell us a little bit about the Islamic faith, how it came to be, what are some of the tenets of the Islamic faith, and so forth. We go back to um, the uh, 6th and the 7th century. Muhammad was born in Saudi Arabia in the Meccan area in 570. When he was 40 years old, he began to react against polytheism as it was practiced in that part of the world. And it was, it was bad. You had uh, uh, Jewish contingents, Christian, Arab, pagan. And in that part of the world was a shrine called the Kaaba, K-A-A-B-A, sometimes pronounced or spelled K-A-B-A. It was a shrine where all kinds of gods and goddesses was worshipped. Muhammad was stirred up about the polytheism he had conversations with Jewish people. He had conversations with Christians of varying stripes. But then what happened is he wanted to go on a quest. He wanted to have an experience with God. So he went up to the caves of Hira, just outside of Mecca a little bit. Hira, H-I-R-A. He sat in a cave like many mystics and monks did. Well, one day he began to hear from 
a being that called itself Gabriel. Gabriel, like the biblical Gabriel angel. This angel was very rough with Muhammad. It, the words he used is crushed him. He went to his wife Khadija, who was 15 years older than he was, and he said that this, this being is crushing him. It led him to thinking of suicide, of throwing himself off the mountainside. Eventually, Khadija convinced him he was talking to an angel and not to a jinn or a demon. Gabriel began to recite to Muhammad things that Allah was saying. Angelology is huge. Angelology is big in Islam. Allah does not have communication with us directly, speaks to angels. And so the angel recited verses what became the Quran. Quran means recite. So it came from Allah to Gabriel to Muhammad, and then Muhammad would tell his friends what it would be called the companions or the pious ones, like his uncle, Abu Kabar, and so on. And so over a period of time, these recitations would be written down, and so that's why we have the word Quran, that which is recited. So the voice in Gabriel said, you are the apostle of Allah, the apostle of Allah. And Muhammad assumed that apostleship, Joe, and identified with this uh, as the messenger of Allah. And the message was against the polytheism of his day. So that's how it began to take shape. He began to run into trouble immediately with his own tribe, his own Arab tribe. He ran into trouble with a Jewish tribe that was in the area and with Christians. And slowly, little by little, he had a few followers, not many. As he grew in strength in Mecca, he ran into trouble, fled. It's called the Hajj, fled to Medina, and that's the year one for uh, Islam, the year that he fled, that's year one, and he established himself in Medina, and the revelations continued for 22 years until he was uh, 62 years old and died, Um, and uh, I think the year was uh, uh, June 8th, uh, 630, in that area, or 632. And so he gathered these followers, and that was the beginning of Islam. Uh, Islam means to submit. The idea is submitting to Allah. And those that submit to Allah are called Muslims. You've heard it said that it is the religion of peace. There is a connection between the idea of Islam and the Hebrew shalom, which means peace. So there's two conjunction or two ideas with the religion of peace. One, that it is supposed to be the peaceful religion, uh, or that when Islam triumphs over all, then there will be peace. You have two different ideas of peace when it comes to the religion of peace. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are all considered Abrahamic faiths. Can you genuinely say that that all Three faiths worship the same God? Basically, no. I'll explain that. Uh, And we don't know how those people who carry out missions toward Muslims, how big of an issue to make this, Joe. Let me tell you why. Um, uh, uh, Admittedly, Abraham, from that flows, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. There is that, that kind of genetic, spiritual-based connection. The question about, is it the same God? We find the full revelation of who God is. We find it in the Old Testament, but it's revealed in Jesus. When the fullness fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son. And then Hebrews says, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in his last days he has spoken to us by his Son. 
if you have the idea of God and we do not see the Trinitarian nature of God, that's not the real God. In my view, in Judaism, to deny the deity of, of the Messiah is not the full picture of God. In Islam, Allah, who denies the deity of Jesus and the crucifixion and other central elements of the Christian faith, then that's not God either. It has a part of God. The full revelation is in Jesus, the Messiah. And I use the term, if Allah wills, for a reason. I have a version of the book called, If God Wills, because of the pressure I got from other Christian show. But we never used that book. I got about 10 copies of that book. I wanted it to appeal to Muslim people. And the book, If Allah Wills, is a book that Muslims accept. I've never had a rejection. And non-Christians will accept, too. It's only the Christians that don't, don't like the If Allah Wills. But once I explain why, then they, they, they start viewing it differently. Okay, yeah. Um, now, let me just say this, Joe. In the Arabian Peninsula, prior to the days of Muhammad, the Christians, what's, the Christian sects, a lot of them were infused with Gnosticism, and the Jewish tribes use Allah as their primary word for God, the Arabic word Allah. It was only natural and impossibly, impossible any other way for for Muhammad not to have used that word because the Jews and the Christians and everybody used the word Allah. The name for God being Allah is pre-Islamic faith. Yes, indeed. Interesting. I did not know that. Yes, indeed. And so for us today in the 21st century, uh, for some it creates a bit of a conundrum. Should I legitimately use the word Allah? Christians differ on this point. It has, it's called contextualization, a big word today, uh, however authentic that is. But uh, some you have say, we cannot use the word Allah. Uh, it, it sets up the wrong idea. It perpetuates a person in that uh, errant view of who God is all the way down the line to those people who say it doesn't make any difference. And I tend about in the middle. Now, here's why. Because what we do as Christians, it's the content of the definition that matters. If I use a law and I use a definition that might fit Judaism or Islam, that's wrong usage. But when I use a law, I mean the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I mean the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So it's uh, and, and Muslims who convert to Christ learn this as, as time goes on. They're taught the scripture, and they learn who Allah is. They get a full picture. They, only, they see, they, early on, they only have a par- partial picture. But then in Christ and a study of the scripture, they get a fuller picture of who this God is. So it becomes, in a sense, irrelevant, the word that you use. The, 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 the hundreds of religions in the world, the languages, um, the languages nationally have all kinds of different words than the letters G-O-D. And uh, uh, for example, uh, Jesus in Arabic is Issa. We say Issa al Masai. that's Jesus the Messiah. That's in the Quran a number of times. And so there are missionaries to Muslims who will speak of Jesus as Issa, apostrophe I-S-A. That's Arabic for Jesus. It's in the Quran many times. And so I, I think it's, a, um, it, it's, not an, it, it's become an issue that may be too big in the minds of some. But for people like myself, I understand a Muslim has this view of who God is. And then the, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. So part of that is that people will see who the God of Scripture really is. That, you know, Abraham didn't live in the days of Jesus. He only had the promises of the coming, the coming promises of a Messiah, and a God would do a work and have a nation and have a people. Who was, who was Paul talking to? And, and this escapes me. I think it was Paul. 
Who was Paul talking to in the Bible when he used the phrase, "You're the unknown God? Because this is a very similar situation, I think, because Paul uses the unknown God, this, this, this title, uh, they had a monument to this unknown God. In Athens, and, yes. Yeah, in Athens, and they had this monument to an unknown God. And so Paul uses that opportunity to use that word, unknown God, and uh, to speak the language, to open the door uh, to the conversation. Now, the God of Abraham, uh, Jesus, wasn't that unknown God, but he used, he used that name uh, to, open up, to open up the conversation. It, is that very similar to what we're doing here? I would agree, Joe. It is very comparable. And uh, he wasn't worried about it. Uh, I think sometimes we get overly concerned about being so precise and making sure everybody's T's are crossed and I's are dotted uh, when we do this. We know we, the process of sanctification after we're converted, we, we grew up a long time. I mean, I wonder how many years did it take me before I began to realize the full extent of the greatness of, of our God. Uh, I, I'm convinced I was out of seminary, probably been a Christian for 10, 12, 14 years before I even began to get some of the glimpses of who God really is. Our conversion is not based on knowledge. We are not Gnostics. <laughs> we, it is the, the power of the Holy Spirit, and then you know, God grows us up. We start as infants. Paul used the distinction between uh, milk and meat. Right. I was on milk for a long time. That's right. Some people, some of us Christians, uh, and there are times that I want to stay on milk. Yeah. I just want to put my fingers in my ears and, 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 and think what I want to think, and that's how I think, and that's how I'm going to think. <laughs> right, Joe. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I do. I do. I've uh, been a pastor for over 45 years. I know. <laughs> where in the... In the history of the Bible, where in the context of the Bible does, does, do Muslims claim that, that Islam comes from? I, I know we, we understand Muhammad, but where in that is it? Where, where, do, where did it branch off, I guess you could say? There is a passage in Deuteronomy 18.15 where God tells Moses that I'm going to raise up a prophet like unto you. Now, Islam goes back and claims that that promise of God to Moses was referencing Muhammad and not Jesus. Of course, we know that is completely disingenuous, uh, but there is nothing in prophecy in Old or New Testament that directly and clearly connects with Muhammad. I view Muhammad as one of a number of groups that have claimed uh, some inheritance in the Scripture, Old and New Testament, uh, we have to admit Joseph Smith and Mormonism is extremely familiar uh, in terms of its points of identity. By the way, uh, Muslims are very, aware, uh, uh, very well aware of the connections between Islam and and Mormonism, and they study Mormonism very intently. Uh, I have uh, an essay that I wrote some 10, 12 years ago where I draw the comparisons between Islam and Mormonism. They are almost perfectly parallel. Both separate books, Book of Mormon, Quran, delivered by an angel, Morani, Gabriel, both of them very works-oriented, that which you had to do, a religion of works. It is, they are so parallel. I was always under the impression that somehow Judaism and Christianity went this way through Isaac, and Muslim went this, three, this way through Ishmael. Is that correct? Not exactly. Let me, that's a, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a little bit different. Islam will bra branches off with Ishmael, and it, it, it is a very complex uh, story of the, um, the tribes that settled in northern Arabia, the sons of Ishmael, 
uh, as opposed to the direction, the family kind of split. There was a definite split. But because Ishmael was born to Abraham and Hagar, they say that the Arab tribes came from Ishmael, but makes him Abrahamic, okay? But that, but that only goes to the, the, the formation of the Arabs. See, after a while, Islam spread beyond the Arabs. So, so but we do have the split. Uh, Isaac, Ishmael, and by the way, the Muslims have a real difference of opinion as to who was going to be sacrificed. Was it, was it um, Isaac or was it Ishmael or somebody else? In Islam is a very confusing kind of thing. There are, various groups have various answers for things. It's not static. You never know really what you're talking about. But, but it always it comes down to here's Arab Muhammad living amongst these Arab tribes, which are primarily descendant from Ishmael. So that's, that's the connection. And then you have, through Isaac, the connection with the Jewish people, and then from the Jewish people, the Christians. So you have automatic contention with them, you know, tribal, clan, family differences. And by the way, that, that whole sociological structure is very meaningful in early Islamic development. So it's complex, but I think that's the distinction. Ishmael is a different branch of the family. Here we have through Isaac, you know, we have the, the, the Hebrew Jews um, direct here. There was the branch. So that's, it's the story of Ishmael. Gotcha. So let's talk about If Allah Wills. Why did you write this book? I intended it to be something that I could give to a Muslim person as a witness. I wanted it to be something that other Christians could give to Muslims who wanted to share the gospel with them, something that they would take and read. It's completely directed at uh, Muslim people. It is very strong. Nothing is, I don't hold back any punches. I go right to the juggler. Uh, first chapter is Tawheed, which is Arabic for the oneness of God. And they say that Christians believe in three gods. You know, you got God the Father, you got Mary, and you got Jesus. They didn't understand. Muhammad simply didn't understand. And, uh, and of course, if it was a messenger, Gabriel was a messenger from Allah— well, it completely damages that whole scenario. Just throws that out altogether. You can't have a God that was completely ignorant of what actually happened. I deal with the oneness of God. I present the God of the Bible, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Echad, uh, the Shema, Deuteronomy 6 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That word one in Hebrew is, we pronounce it echad, E-C-H-A-D. In Genesis, Adam and Eve are an echad. They are one. They're two different. They're separate, but they are an echad. The God of Scripture is an echad. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Same nature, same will, same everything. That makes an echad. And... I explain that in the first chapter. I draw a distinction in a contrast between Muhammad and Jesus. Fantastic differentiation. Islam has a high regard for for Jesus, but they make two major changes. One as to who he is, the actual physical son of God the Father and Mary, a human woman. That's one error because it takes away from the reason for the cross. The second area has to do with what happened at the cross. They say Jesus never died on the cross. In the Arabian Peninsula at that period in history and before, the Gnostics, as they intertwined with Christian theology, which Gnostics did with all the different religions, for example, when you read the Gospel of John, 1 John, uh, they 
John is dealing with Gnostic Christianity. One of the major areas of uh, Gnosticism is called docetism from the Greek word dose to seem. They said that the one who died on the cross only seemed to be Jesus. Some will say, well, it was Judas Iscariot. Jesus did not die on the cross, and that's what Islam says. They adopted Gnostic, docetic view of the crucifixion. So therefore, they go to the heart of the matter as to who Jesus is, Emmanuel, God in the flesh, taking our sin upon himself, and secondly, what he did, that taking our sin, because he didn't die on the cross. He was ascended to heaven and returns at the second coming and the resurrection, what they call the day of judgment. They don't call it the second coming. They call it the day of judgment and resurrection. And you can't be a Muslim unless you believe in the day of judgment. How do you open up the conversation uh, with a Muslim? I mean, you spend time, quality time, not just, as I understand, you spend a lot of time in the Muslim community. Not as much as I'd like to. I don't want to, I don't, I, I got to back you up on that. I don't spend a lot of time in the Muslim community. I go to the mosque on Fridays. I have interaction. I'm doing a new television program with an imam. I have a lot of connection with him. But I limit it. I limit it. I don't try to cozy up and be buddy-buddy. I'm the real deal with them. I'm the pastor. I'm not just trying to be friends with them and make contact. That's what I, I, not what I want to do. I don't want them to get confused about who I am. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm not really trying to be friends. I would venture to guess when I use the word a lot of time, I use that in the context of how much time the average Christian leader spends with the Muslim community. Okay. And I would bet in comparison, Kent, you spend a lot of time I have in the two, Muslim community. I have three Muslim imam phone numbers in my, my cell phone right now. I can show them, show them to you. Imam Fasi, Imam Abdullah, and Imam Abu Qadir. And they're all friends of mine. They're friends. I mean, I know them. I, it's not like I hang out, we watch television, but we interchange. We can talk to each other on the phone. We can show up. Uh, I had an imam preach a sermon at our church. Do they understand that your motivation? They do. I'm going to come back to that comment that you just they made. They do know what I'm about. Do they understand that your motivation is to convert them personally to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Exactly. The two major evangelical religions in the world are Christianity and Islam. Islam are constant evangelists. We have to understand that. They are after you all the time. When I was starting going to the mosque, and I would sit there and I'd read the Quran sitting in the back. I never prayed with them. I never got down on my knees. i read the Quran. The, the, so many Muslims came look at me and they'd smile. They were thinking I was converting. But after a while, they realized I was not. I was not converting. I don't want, to th- want them to think, have any idea that I'm converting here or that I have any other interest and that I want to learn about it because I want to tell you the gospel. It's a mistake in my view to uh, over-contextualize to the point where you're becoming their friend and you don't, that they don't, they won't, listen, Joe, they would not trust you if, if they didn't understand your real motivation. They would not trust me if they, if they thought I would just hear for whatever reason, I'm going to make a friend with you to try to convert you. That's disingenuous. That's dishonest. And they're very quick to pick that up. They know what I'm about. Why in the world, Kent, would you have an imam preach at your church? Well, it took an, it was an accident. Here's what happened. I wanted to bring Abu Qadir to our church on a Sunday morning because this is a big deal for our church. We have, we filmed four programs. We're not going to start broadcasting until February. And it's a kind of a long story, but I brought our church to it. By the way, I told everybody in our church, here's what we're doing. This was a couple of years ago. If anybody wants out, Okay, it's okay. No prejudice. You can leave if you're afraid. Um, and then we've been putting this program together. 
And I wanted everybody in their church to see this imam. I wanted to alleviate their fears. Here's the real guy. And I wanted him to see us too. So what I told him was, uh, during the announcements, I'm going to ask you to come up. And I said, you got five minutes just to say hello and say a word or two. He preached at us for about 20, 25 minutes around that area. And he preached a Muslim sermon. He didn't realize that the people he was talking to knew at least as much about Islam as he did. (laughs) This wasn't a novice group. Right. This is a small congregation. And we, you know, I have to say this. Muslims practice taqiyya. Taqiyya is an Arabic word that means dissimulation. Muhammad had a job for one of his lieutenants to do. He had to go out and deal with a, uh, a rebellious tribe. This leader came to Muhammad and say, uh, do I have to, basically, to paraphrase, do I have to tell them the truth? Muhammad said no. So taqiyya means you can deceive in order to defend or advance Islam. Well... The ends justify the means. They lie. It becomes a problem. It becomes a problem because it is so, lying is so ingrained that they they don't even realize they're doing it anymore. I don't think their conscience gives them a little ping. They just lie, and they all do. I have to tell you the story. When I was teaching Islamic studies, I had a, a Shia imam from Fremont, Wonderful Afghani young man. He got lost. He came in later. I had already started on my studies. I was talking about Takiya. He stood there, name of Ahmad, he stood there and listened to me talk about Takiya. So he proceeds about an hour and a half, and he's lying up one side and down another. We all know it. Finally, he gets to the end, and I, he says, well, the harsh things that Muhammad said, he said in Mecca. He didn't say them in Medina. It's exactly the reverse. Recitations came in Mecca, came in Medina. The Meccan ones were when he was friends with the Christian and Jewish tribes. They were against him in Medina, and he came out with all of the hateful, cut off your head, strike terror in the heart, uh, strike at the neck, in Medina. And so he said the reverse. I said, wait a minute. I said, I can't let this go. I said, now you just told us the absolute reverse of the truth. I told him, told him the exact reverse. And he just looked at me, about 26 year old young man, did not reply. All of a sudden he realized he'd done the typical lie. And I caught him at it. And everybody knew there was no way to reply. This is typical. You mentioned you mentioned uh, in your in this statement um, about some of the brutal things that Muhammad taught in Medina. Is that correct? In Medina, yes. Okay. We can't talk about reaching out to Muslims without talking about terrorism. That's true. We can't because many Christians, me being one of them, have this idea of Islam that it is not a, although they say it's a, uh, a faith of peace, a religion of peace, that it has not manifest itself. It has the, the Muslim faith has, has grasped the hold of terrorism they don't speak out against terrorism, at least from what I've seen. I'm speaking from a position of ignorance to some point. So Kent, I'm here to ask you to correct me if I'm wrong or to support, support me if I'm, if I'm correct. They don't spe- you don't hear Muslim, the Muslim community speaking out fervently against acts of terrorism. How do you, how do you reach out? How do you evangelize to the Islamic community, to Muslims, 
how do you reach out to the to this to this group of people in light of terrorism? Terrorism is unhappily what we has called uh, one of the the pillars. They call it the sixth pillar. Uh, lesser jihad. The greater jihad is personal development, maturity. Lesser jihad is the terrorism. It is part and parcel of Islam. It carries a far greater impact as well because to please Allah is very difficult. One of the 99 names of Allah is the deceiver. Constantly in the Quran, it says that he leads astray. Muhammad was not assured of his place in paradise. When you hear a Muslim speak, he'll say Muhammad, and is gonna, then you're going to hear, peace be upon him. That is literally a prayer to Allah that Muhammad would be in paradise. Muhammad did not know he was going to be in paradise. But what happened is, in the Quran, one way to enter paradise is to die in violent jihad. Not only that, you get to take 70 members of your family with you if you do. Families will promote a son or a daughter to violent jihad because it assures the family a place in paradise. That's one stream. It's very confused. Let me tell you, Joe, it is so confused. Built into the Quran is terrorism. Is this taught as a tenet of the Islamic faith, terrorism. This is a part of their faith that they are required to act upon. Islam, global strategy is that Sharia law dominate. There'll be not separate religions and states, it's all joined in one. Islam rules, that's why Sharia law is so important to them. Their long-term strategy is to dominate the world. Either you convert to Islam or uh, you submit to Islam uh, and, but not join and various penalties are ensue or you're, you're killed. That's, that's the program for Islam. It is very much part of the Quran. It is part of the history, motif of Islam. There have been times when Muslims and Jews and Christians have lived together with peace. Not even having submission. It, there have been times, but there are periodic revivals, and we are experiencing one of the revivals largely fueled by oil money, starting about the uh, 1950s, the Salafi movement or the Wahhabi movement, uh, there's various names for it, who recognize that Islam is slipping. Islam does not do well in peaceful times in the spiritual marketplace. It loses out. It's its theology, its ideology is not strong. And so they have, in, in so many ways, spiritually, intellectually, uh, in terms of cultural development, lag behind. And this current one, this current revival that we're seeing now is a result of that. It's part of the religion. They don't always adhere to it. Now, in Islam right now, you'll have what are called the traditionalist or the pious ones. There's a couple different terms for them. And then over here, you'll have the term the progressives. Now, the traditionalists, they want life to be like it was in the 7th century. The 7th century, where Mirren had long beards. You couldn't be a Muslim, Joe. You'd have to grow a beard. I couldn't either. <laughs> and Good the beard is very important. You would, you would, you would, it would flabbergast you to know how important a beard was to have a beard um, and to live like they did in the seventh century. They wanted to be exactly like Muhammad, to live like he did, to eat with only his right hand, to sleep on your right hand, on your right side, everything like Muhammad. They want to go back to that, that period. Uh, and so everything that's West, everything that is modern, they despise. They want to eliminate all of that, which does not comport with 7th century Arabian culture, days of Muhammad. So that is a big deal for them. On the other side, the, the, ref, the reformers, the progressives, they are wanting 
to abandon those things to disallow their people to live in peace and have their families, have their religion, and so on. So there's a, a, a marked divide in these two areas. Uh, in this book, I detail four books of Ayan Hirsi Ali, Harvard University professor, Somalia-born, was a member of the Dutch parliament, and uh, she authored four books, two New York Times bestsellers. She's become an atheist. She argues for reform. She even tells Christians, you Christians need to go into the Muslim ghettos and start Christian bookstores and start churches in the Muslim ghetto. That's the only way you're going to reach the Muslims. This is the only way Islam's going to change. And then uh, uh, Reza Aslan, who just got fired by CNN, UC professor in Riverside, I, I summarize his book, No God But God, here in Islamic Studies, and he argues for reform too. He's a Sufi. He's out there on the fringe. Okay, he exposed himself on CNN as sort of a quack. But nevertheless, you've got major voices in Islam arguing for reform. They want away from that Islamic terrorist idea. The imam that I'm talking with, he disavows terrorism altogether. At least he says he does. But Islam, whenever they're a minority in any community, if they're a minority, and they have it all spelled out in terms of percentages, when you get to 7%, you get to 10%, you get to 12%, things change. They become more political. And when you get to be a majority, then widespread terrorism is allocated. Islam is very sophisticated. They are very patient. They have a long-term strategy. A 50-year plan is not a long plan for Muslims. They'll wait generations. They have their plans. They've long used immigration as a plan of spreading Islam. That's why they have lots of wives and lots of kids. They grow by that way. That's the primary way that they grow. Having many wives, a bunch of kids, and let me tell you, no Christian has an identity as a Christian like a Muslim has an identity as a Muslim. We are lightweights, lightweights when it comes to them. You want to talk about religious commitment. You don't see it in Christianity. And that's good. And that's good because they take it to a cultic extreme. When a little child is born, the father whispers a special ritualistic slogan into the ear of the newborn. By the time they're five or six years old, they know more passages in the Bible that supposedly contradict are contradictory than most Christians know when they're 40, 50, 60 years old. They are born apologists. They are raised apologists. They are very religious. Their uh, Muslim identity is their whole life identity. Conversion for a Muslim is a dramatic, dramatic miracle for a Muslim to, to be converted. And... Uh, and I know that there is a strategy that Muslims carry of false conversion. They falsely convert to Christianity, and, uh, and they will get away with it, away with it in gospel light churches, liberal churches. They'll get away with it. Uh, it's it's just another strategy that Islam employs, and they do it big time here in America. Sorry. It happens. I'll be honest with you, Kent. I, I came into this conversation thinking that I'm going to I'm, I'm going to be speaking with somebody that is soft on Islam and soft on that, the Joe. Muslim community. <laughs> and if we just love them, they'll come to Jesus. If we just if we just treat them good, they'll come to Jesus. If we use the word Allah, come on, let's use the word Allah, and not offend them, and let's use the word instead of using the word God, and that way we'll we'll nice them to Jesus. OK, <laughs> and uh, you are everything but that you pull no punches with this community. You interact with them. You fellowship with them. You have friends. You are calling you, you call them friends, but you certainly pull no punches with them. How can how can the Christian use your use your, the tools that you've put together? Islamic studies, equipping the Christian, wit, to, the, equipping the Christian witness to Muslim. And if Allah wills, how can we use these books to first of all, I want to ask this question: uh, Are do you feel like you you personally, keeping in mind terrorism, keeping in mind their the their their 
their tenant to lie to get close to you to 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 bring you to their faith um do you think that you are uniquely equipped to minister to the muslim community or do you think that we should all take that effort to go into the muslim community and interact with them and to evangelize to them in in the scripture we see in the book of acts uh, that the early christians took the gospel into pagan areas uh, even when Rome started persecuting the Christians, the Christians didn't continue their missionary evangelistic activities. Christians in China at the time of Mao Zedong, uh, they didn't stop their witness. Christians in Muslim countries today don't stop their witness, even in the threat of death, and even worse than death, torture and horrible things done to family members. It still goes on. We take that risk. There's no short cutting that. We do take a risk. I announce to our church, if anyone wants to leave, you're welcome to leave, but I am, I'm doing this ministry. Guess how many people left? Nobody. Nobody left. And uh, we, we take it, we see that this is the Christian witness. The Christian witness is more than our lives. Um, it's the only important thing we really do. It's the great calling. Uh, my, one of my new books coming out is called Evangel- uh, Christ- Biblical Christianity is Evangelical. I identify Christians according to their evangelistic commitment. Jesus told us to do this numbers of times, completely lived out in the book of Acts and in the letters of Paul and in the early history of the church. Christians have always been evangelical. I don't care what the denomination is. I don't care the differences in various points of theology. I'm going to tell you a story. Coming back from Orlando at the NBR, National Religious Broadcaster. NRB. NRB. Uh, I was in TSA line. I saw a guy fiddling with a hat. I turned around. I thought, I know what that hat is. That is the hat of an Orthodox priest. Sure enough, uh, Father Gabriel Nadoff, pastor of the Greek Orthodox Church in Nazareth. We started talking about this. I was talking about my new book. And he agreed. He said, it doesn't matter if you're Maronite, Coptic, Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant. How, what is our unity? What is the unity of our faith despite our differences in theologies? It is our evangelical nature. And what he's about is leading Jews and Muslims to Christ in Nazareth. He has a program, he had a brochure, he's shaking hands with uh, Benjamin uh, Netanyahu of, of Israel, and he's there, he said, I'm here, our organization is to protect Jewish people and Muslim people who are coming to Christ. We need the protection in Nazareth. We're going to have him on our TV program by Skype soon. But uh, that's our identity. It is our evangelical nature that we take the gospel out to whomever we get to do it. So how do we practically use these tools? Well, this, this, actually, this book is pretty essential because you want this Islamic studies because you want to feel comfortable. I spent many years studying Islam before I wrote If Allah Wills. It was important for me to understand it. I have to have some knowledge of Islam, what these people were thinking. So I think this book is most important to have a personal, have a strength, you have confidence, you know what you're talking about. You have to spend some time, it's not simple. You have to be a diligent student, you have to learn. You have to learn what it's about. This is intended to be a tool to give Muslim people because they'll read it. So we have two books here. We're talking about, again, Islamic Studies, which is the book that, uh, that Kent just, just referenced to help, uh, help Christians understand and give them a, at least a, a, a workable foundation of the uh, Islamic faith. Is that right? That's exactly right. And then we have the, the other book called If Allah Wills. That is an evangelical tool to give to, uh, to, give to Muslims. Uh, to start the conversation or to give them some resource uh, introduction into the 
move them from from their Muslim belief to Christianity. Is that right? You got it, Joe. Okay. So we're talking about those two books. Uh, Kenton references this book and that book. So the first book he was talking about was Islamic Studies, and the second book that he's talking about is If Allah Wills. Both of those books will be available uh, on our website at onfaithsedge.com. Uh, but I just want to make sure that that's clear, the two books that we're talking about. We need to speak to the Muslim community. We need to, we need to speak intelligently because they're intelligent on their own faith. They, they you know, grant them this. They, they do, culturally, they do a very good job at teaching their children the tenets of their faith. They Is do. That, they, they do. Uh, but these two, these two tools will equip us, the Christian, uh, to not cozy up to the Islamic community or the or the or our or Muslim friends, but to speak to them intelligently and bring them along. I am really excited to to dig into these books because I'll be the first one to tell you other than other than some some cursory reading that I've that I've done, uh, I'm I'm ignorant on how to relate to the Muslim community. Can can we talk a little bit about your personal faith? Sure. How, how did you come to believe in Jesus Christ? I remember when my dad took me down to the train station in Los Angeles to send, say goodbye to me as I went to uh, basic training at Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. He handed me a New Testament. I was 19 years old. And I got on board, and when I found a trash can, I threw that New Testament away. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, my dad was converted when I was 15 years old at a Billy Graham Crusade in Los Angeles. Uh, I resisted Christianity. I didn't want to associate with Christians, but I was wanting to finish my education while I was in the military. I was a medic with second casualty staging flight. I worked at night. I went to college. I was taking a philosophy of religion class taking two philosophy classes, two psychology classes at UC Davis, just a little south of Sacramento, just up from uh, Travis Air Force Base. Professor Child was a professor of, a professor of religion, and we had to write a, a book, uh, uh, a paper on um, a, a world religion. Well, I picked Christianity. I thought, I know all about Christianity. Well, I didn't know anything. So... I lived right next door to a church in Sassoon. I went there, couldn't figure it out. My landlord went to a Lutheran church in Fairfield. I went there, couldn't figure it out. It never occurred to me to go to a library and get a book on it. Uh, then I got invited by two surgery techs at, at the hospital at Travis, uh, Vern Hogue and Don Etheridge, to come to their church, First Baptist Church of Fairfield. A Southern Baptist Church. I didn't know Southern Baptist from Catholic, from Pentecostal to whatever. I didn't know, didn't care. And Pastor Bob Lewis is preaching from uh, the Ozarks in Arkansas. And uh, I heard the gospel for the first time. I was on about a nine-month struggle with it. Nine months. And in a way, <clears throat> I, was, I was doing pretty good resisting. I wasn't going to go there. And in a way that I really can't explain, all of a sudden, I was converted. I was converted. I believed in Jesus. I, uh, I read the Bible from just going on and on and on and on and on. Um, I got involved as much as I could at church with my Air Force duties. Uh, and <clears throat> I just loved it. I loved everything about it. It was just wonderful. Uh, and I graduated from college. I was in a master's program in counseling. My whole background is psychology. I ran a Christian counseling center for 10 years during the 70s. And um, so uh, I felt, I went, oh, I got to tell you the story. I went to a prayer meeting. Pastor Bob, at, he was doing a revival up in by the Napa area. He asked us, he said to the church, would you gather together for prayer? Strangely enough, a lieutenant, and 
enlisted guys like me, never talked to lieutenant, much less sergeants. This lieutenant I never knew, he invited me to come to a prayer meeting to pray for Pastor Lewis for the revival up in Boys Hot Springs. That's where it was. I went to his house. I'd never been there before. I couldn't tell you where it was. It was the summertime. We started praying when it was light. We were all on our knees. It got dark. Somebody said, okay, we're done. I walked out. And I knew God called me to preach, called me into the ministry. I went and told Pastor Lewis. It was a big church. I never mentioned it. I didn't spend maybe five minutes my whole time I was there talking to him, but I told him. They licensed me to preach. I was two or three months away from my master's degree at Sacramento State. I quit, and in August of 1968, I moved onto the campus of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary in Mill Valley, Southern Baptist Seminary, and I got a couple degrees and was involved in the Jesus People Movement, pastored a church during that time. I was a, I was a hippie street preacher in 19... I was... Okay, now this will sound strange, Wait till you see the picture of Kent Philpot on our website, and you're going to look at that picture and you're going to say, that was a hippie preacher? <laughs> Man, you're, you, you're like me, Kent. You're about as white bread, conservative, Midwestern looking as they come. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is so anyway uh, um that's what it was and uh i avoid i i just love to preach the gospel okay i went through a divorce in 1980 it's a long story um it all started when my major professor my my doctorate uh said who was one of the nation's leading experts on cults and conversions he said can't the church that you started is cultic. 1978, this occurred. And I brought him our theological statement the very next week. I had to meet with him once a year, once a week. And uh, he says, oh, your theology, your doctrine's fine. He says, it's your methodology or your ecclesiology. Because we were very charismatic and we directed people's lives by prophecy. I did some bad things. I directed people to do stuff that was out of the top of my head and said, thus saith the Lord. I'm sorry, I can't go back. I have paid big price for it. It ended in a tragedy for me, and I went to law school. I packed my Bible, and uh, I was never going to open it again because of the treatment that I received from the— I started a series of churches out of the Jesus People Movement. And rather than cause trouble, I just resigned. And uh, so I packed my Bible for two weeks, but I couldn't stand it. I, then I got it out again and started going back to churches. And uh, a friend that I had graduated from uh, wanted me to become a BS associate pastor. And uh, at the same time, I had a law. I had a practice. I was. I had a, a partner. We had a. a a particular kind of legal service. It was large, came the largest one in Marin County. Loved doing it, made a lot of money. And what happened was, because they knew that I was a church starter, they wanted to ask me if I'd like to come to this, what became Miller Avenue Baptist Church in 1984. And I said, okay, try to keep my business for a while, quit, finally. And I've been there ever since, so I went back. But it was, a, uh, it was something that I had to do because the call of God on your life is stronger than anything else, even when you go through really difficult times. And so I refer to myself as a gospel preacher and a Bible teacher. That's what I live to do. I can't stand it not to preach. <laughs> <laughs> i got to be a preacher. Through... through either through your life as a, as a Christian or especially through uh, your work in the Muslim community and reaching out to Muslims and, and evangelizing to Muslims. Have you ever had a time where you questioned your faith or even the existence of God or whether even this Christianity is the right path? I would say this, Joe. I'm, I'm trying to be as clear and I don't think I've ever been asked this question in my life. 
I would have to say, I never doubted Jesus. What I did doubt was my interpretation of what church was. Uh, Because I saw in the Jesus People movement, in the charismatic Pentecostal movement that I was thoroughly a part of, I saw such confusion. Uh, I was... Uh, I was standing against the what we call the um, the shepherding movement. Uh, we loved Bob Mumford and Charles Simpson. I preached in Charles Simpson Church in Mobile, Alabama. I knew Don Basham and Ern, uh, Ern Baxter and Don Basham. I learned a lot from Don Basham. I was friends with Bob Mumford. I had to oppose it. Uh, Bob and I very uh, later on became friends. Um, and I became friends with Charles Simpson again, too, but I had to oppose what they were doing. It failed. It imploded. Bob even asked me to forgive him. We ran each other into each other at San Quentin. Uh, I didn't, he didn't know I was around. I didn't know he was around, and we got together. The Fort Lauderdale Five, I don't know if you know anything about that stuff. Just to be clear, when he says ran into each other at San Quentin? That was at the gate, at the East Gate. He was coming out of the prison. I was coming in. So you're not saying that you and him spent some time in a cell together? No, he was ministering out of the Protestant <laughs> chapel, and so was I. And we were we were coming in to do ministry in the in San Quentin. But um, so to answer your question, I was because I, I was, was about con- to say, man, you've lived a life, brother. I know. I was confused about how to do church. I was confused about that sort of thing. I saw other Jesus people movement. People move, uh, leaving evangelical Christianity, going into Roman Catholicism, going into Greek Orthodoxy, uh, Russian Orthodox churches we have in San Francisco. And I began to wonder, maybe I'm off on the wrong track about how to do churches. That I did question, Joe, that I questioned. I never questioned the Bible. I love the Scripture. I'm pretty good in Greek and Hebrew. That's all I do is preach verse by verse. And um, uh, I consider myself fairly adept in these areas. Uh, And I love the Word. I love being with His people. I love preaching the gospel, teaching, and so on. And I I no longer really have those battles. I gave it up. You know, we do the best we can church-wise. There's no perfect church. My church isn't perfect because I'm not perfect, and there's not a perfect person in a church. So we get along the best we can. We keep the things first and foremost in front of us, that we're here to be followers of Jesus and communicate the gospel. I think a church can be a healthy church if it keeps that those two principles in front of them. We're here to be simple followers of Jesus, and we're here to present the gospel to the world. I think that keeps us clean as we can get. That's my view. I, I think it, I'm fairly on track with that. Finally, as we, as, we, as we wrap up, Kent, what would you say to that person? Maybe a, maybe a, uh, a current Muslim, somebody that is uh, investigating Christianity or right on faith's edge, making that choice to believe or not to believe in Jesus Christ. I have a, I have a kind of a funny, this may... F- a little. This sounds maybe a little bit extreme. Um, here's what I would tell them. I would pull out Matthew twenty-eight, nineteen, and twenty. I would quote where it says, "Jesus said, go, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit." And I'm with you to the end of the age. I say now, what that means to us is one now. You're born again, you become a disciple of Jesus, and you get baptized. Now, I think baptism is really important. Now, of course, I'm a Baptist preacher. Shocking, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> but I think that's very important, um, that we publicly identify with Jesus Christ by being baptized. That's a major step for Muslim. Now, if they said, I can't do that, I would say, okay, 
But if you decide so at some point, let me know and we'll fill up the baptistry. Okay? That's how I approach it. I, I'm not going to force anybody into anything. Make no demands on them. Offer ministry. Offer to teach them to be in fellowship, to do those things. That's. I think I answered your question, Joe. I don't think we can say anything more than that, to be quite honest with you. Okay. Kent, thank you so much for being with us today. The books are Islamic Studies, Equipping the Christian Witness to Muslim, and If Allah Wills. Islamic Studies, that book is for the Christian to help them understand um, the Muslim, the Islamic faith. And If Allah Wills is specifically written to um, the Muslim to understand the Christian faith and to bring them along. Is that correct? That's it, Joe. Kent, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. God bless you, brother. Thank you, and you too. You can find out more about Kent Philpot at earthenvesseljournal.com. That's earthenvesseljournal.com. And his books are available on our website at onfaithsedge.com slash 84. That's onfaithsedge.com slash 84. And if you use the link uh, on our website to buy the book, again, we'll get a small commission and it doesn't cost you a penny more. Remember, I want to hear your story. Go to onfaithsedge.com slash your story and we'll get together and chat. Again, that's onfaithsedge.com slash your story. I would love to hear from you. That will wrap up today's show. Thank you to Kent Philpot for being with us and thank you for listening. You mean a lot to me and you mean a lot to this show. Remember, God is real. He loves you, and so do I. God bless. Thank you for listening to On Faith's Edge. You can subscribe to the show via iTunes, Stitcher, Internet Radio, or your favorite podcast app on Android, Apple, or Windows devices. To reach out to Joe or leave comments about the show, visit onfaithsedge.com. You're important to us, and we would love to hear from you. 